It's our country. It's not theirs. It's not a bunch of used car dealers from Southern California. Democracy, you have to be a player. Imagine a man who lived a life like a runaway freight train, fueled by a cocktail of drugs that would make Keith Richards blush. A man who turned journalism on its head and created some of the most electrifying prose of the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up, because we're about to dive into the wild, weird, and wonderful world of Hunter S. Thompson. Born on July 18, 1937, in Louisville, Kentucky, Hunter Stockton Thompson would grow up to be more than just a journalist. He'd become a counterculture icon, a literary outlaw, and the inventor of gonzo journalism. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, we need to understand the madness that shaped the man. Young Hunter's childhood was like a southern gothic novel come to life. His father, a World War I vet and insurance agent, died when Hunter was just a teen, leaving his mother to wrangle three boys on her own. And let me tell you, Hunter wasn't making it easy. While most kids were playing baseball and doing homework, Thompson was busy building a rap sheet that would make Al Capone proud. We're talking shoplifting, vandalism, and even robbery. But here's the kicker. At the same time, he was flexing his literary muscles in the prestigious Athenaeum Literary Association. His antics eventually landed him in hot water. The judge gave him a choice, prison or the military. Thompson chose the latter, and in 1956, he joined the U.S. Air Force. Now, you might think the military would straighten him out, right? Wrong. Thompson managed to weasel his way into becoming a sports editor for the base newspaper. It was here that he first dipped his toes into the wild waters of journalism. After being honorably discharged in 1958, much to the relief of his commanding officers, no doubt, Thompson bounced around like a pinball. He worked for small-town newspapers, had a stint as a copyboy for Time magazine, and even landed in Puerto Rico, where he began writing his first novel, The Rum Diary. But the real fireworks were yet to come. In 1965, Thompson got an assignment that would change everything. He was tasked with writing an article about the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club for The Nation magazine. Now, most journalists would have maybe spent a weekend with the Angels, taken some notes, and called it a day. But not our man Thompson. No, sir. He spent an entire year living and riding with the notorious biker gang. The result? A book called Hells Angels, The Strange and Terrible Saga of the Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs. This wasn't just a book. It was a literary hand grenade. Thompson didn't just report on the Hells Angels. He became part of the story. This was the birth of what would later be called gonzo journalism. But what exactly is gonzo journalism? Well, imagine if your crazy uncle decided to write a news article after a three-day bender. It's subjective. It's wild. And it blurs the line between fact and fiction. But here's the thing. It's also brutally honest and deeply insightful. With the success of Hell's Angels, Thompson was riding high. He bought a compound near Aspen, Colorado, which he dubbed Owl Creek. But don't go thinking he was settling down. Oh no, Thompson was just getting started. Now, let's talk about Thompson's, shall we say, unique approach to life. Most people have a daily routine. Thompson had a daily bender that would floor most mere mortals. Picture this, Thompson would rise from his slumber at the crack of 3 p.m. Yes. You heard that right. While the rest of the world was thinking about an afternoon coffee, Thompson was kickstarting his day with a healthy dose of Chivas Regal and cigarettes. But that was just the warm up act. By 4 a.m. the next morning, he'd have consumed more cocaine than Tony Montana in Scarface. Lunch? A feast fit for a king. If that king had a death wish, Thompson would hit up the Woody Creek Tavern for a spread of margaritas, fried onion rings, and yes, more cocaine. As night fell, things got even wilder. LSD at 10 p.m.? Why not? This was followed by a smorgasbord of drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes that would make a pharmacy blush. And just when you thought it couldn't get any more bizarre, Thompson would cap off his day with a 6 a.m. hot tub session, complete with champagne and fettuccine Alfredo. Because nothing says balanced breakfast like pasta and bubbly in a jacuzzi, right? This frenetic lifestyle wasn't just for kicks. It fueled Thompson's unique voice, giving birth to some of the most electrifying prose of the 20th century. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's rewind a bit to 1970, when Thompson truly found his groove. But Thompson wasn't content with just shaking up the journalism world. 
he decided to dive into politics too. In 1970, he ran for sheriff of Pitkin County, Colorado, on what he called the Freak Power Ticket. His campaign promises included renaming Aspen to Fat City and ripping up the streets to replace them with bike paths. He also vowed to eat mescaline for breakfast every day. Surprisingly, he only narrowly lost the election. Now, let's talk about Thompson's magnum opus, the work that would cement his place in the literary pantheon. In 1971, Thompson was sent to Las Vegas to cover a motorcycle race called the Mint 400. What he came back with was, well, it certainly wasn't a sports article, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. A savage journey to the heart of the American dream hit bookstores in 1972 like a dose of pure adrenaline. It wasn't just a book, it was a manifesto, a middle finger to the establishment, and a hilarious, terrifying exploration of the death of the American dream. The book follows Thompson's alter ego, Raoul Duke, and his attorney, Dr. Gonzo, on a drug-fueled rampage through Las Vegas. It's a wild ride filled with hallucinations, paranoia, and biting social commentary. If you've never read it, imagine The Hangover Movie, but written by a genius on acid. One of the most infamous scenes involves Thompson and his attorney checking into a Las Vegas hotel while tripping on LSD. Thompson hallucinated that the hotel lobby was flooded with blood and lizards were lounging on the furniture. Instead of fleeing in terror, he calmly checked in, all while narrating the surreal scene to the readers. This wasn't just journalism, this was a front row seat to the wildest show on earth. Hot on the heels of fear and loathing in Las Vegas came fear and loathing on the campaign trail, 72. This book took Thompson's unique brand of gonzo journalism and applied it to the 1972 presidential campaign. It was like injecting pure caffeine into the veins of political journalism. Thompson didn't just cover the campaign, he became part of it. He drank with the candidates, partied with the staffers, and exposed the absurdity of the whole process. His coverage was as much about the madness of American politics as it was about the candidates themselves. In one memorable incident, Thompson spread a rumor that Democratic candidate Edmund Muskie was addicted to a mysterious drug called Ibogaine. The rumor gained so much traction that Muskie's campaign had to issue a formal denial. Thompson later admitted he'd made the whole thing up, but defended it as a way of illustrating how easily false information could spread in a campaign. Now, you might be thinking, this guy sounds like he was living the dream. And in many ways, he was. But remember that old saying about burning the candle at both ends? Well, Thompson was basically using a flamethrower on his candle. His prodigious consumption of drugs and alcohol, once the fuel for his creative fire, began to take its toll. The 1970s and beyond saw Thompson struggling with deadlines, abandoning projects, and battling to recapture the magic of his earlier work. But even as his output slowed, Thompson's influence continued to grow. He became more than just a writer. He was a cultural icon, a symbol of rebellion against authority and conventional wisdom. He was the guy who not only spoke truth to power, but did it while wearing Hawaiian shirts and aviator sunglasses. Thompson's later years were a mix of triumphs and struggles. He continued to write, and much of his earlier work was republished to great acclaim. In 2003, he released Kingdom of Fear, a semi-autobiographical work that proved he still had that old gonzo magic. Throughout his life, Thompson's love affair with firearms never waned. His compound in Woody Creek, Colorado, dubbed Owl Farm, was like a private shooting range. He'd often wake his neighbors in the middle of the night with the sound of gunfire. When asked about it, he'd simply say he was defending his property from wastrels and terrorists. But the wild ride couldn't last forever. On February 20th, 2005, at the age of 67, Hunter S. Thompson took his own life at his Owl Creek compound. He had been struggling with numerous health problems and chronic pain. In his suicide note titled, Football Season Is Over, he wrote, No more games, no more bombs, no more walking, no more fun, no more swimming. 67, that is 17 years past 50, 17 more than I needed or wanted. Boring, I am always bitchy, no fun for anybody. 67, you are getting greedy, act your old age, relax, this won't hurt. Even in death, Thompson remained true to his larger-than-life persona. His ashes were fired from a cannon in a private ceremony, accompanied by Bob Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man. 
The cannon was mounted atop a 153-foot tower, shaped like a double-thumbed fist clutching a peyote button, a symbol Thompson used throughout his career. Hollywood star Johnny Depp, a close friend of Thompson's, footed the $3 million bill for this final spectacle. So, what's the legacy of Hunter S. Thompson? Well, he changed journalism forever. He showed that a writer could be part of the story, that subjectivity could be a strength rather than a weakness. He inspired generations of writers to push boundaries and question authority. But perhaps more importantly, Thompson embodied a uniquely American spirit of rebellion and individualism. He lived life on his own terms, consequences be damned. He once wrote, Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. And what a ride it was, Hunter. What a ride it was. Love him or hate him, there's no denying that Hunter S. Thompson lived and wrote on the razor's edge of American culture. He pushed the boundaries of journalism, literature, and human endurance. He was a mad genius, a literary outlaw, and a true American original. In a world of conformity and caution, Thompson dared to be different, dared to be dangerous, dared to be himself. As we look back on the wildlife and times of Hunter S. Thompson, we're left with a simple truth. There will never be another quite like him. And maybe, just maybe, that's a good thing. After all, could the world handle another Hunter S. Thompson? I don't know about you, but I'm not sure my liver could take it.